Hello, I'd like to welcome you to the Chapter 1 Study Guide for Physical Geology class at San Jacinto College. Uh, I am Mr. Sadler. Uh, this, uh, do, this program, this review was made uh, with a program called Dosiri, and I have created this on my iPad for use on a YouTube channel. So let's begin. This is question number one. Uh, what do you call the study of the Earth? And I'm just going to leave that one open because I'm about to uh, answer it here in question number two. So can you name the three categories of geology that are taught in pretty much any university or college setting? Of course, they are physical, historical, and environmental geology. Question number three, uh, can you name two disciplines that we talked about in class of geology? So question number four, is it really true that geology and people and the environment are all interconnected? And can you provide an example of their interconnectivity? Question number five, uh, who is this fellow right here? And what was his major contribution to geology? Was he a catastrophist? And what does it mean to be a catastrophist? Was he a Neptunist? Or do you think that he uh, came up with the idea of uniformitarianism? And what is this idea, and what is the modern name for uniformitarianism? Question number six. If we consider a mountain in the world... What are some things uh, with regard to this mountain that can happen very suddenly? And are there other processes in geology that happen very slowly with the mountain? So here's a quick little example. What if a big chunk of rock uh, slides off or falls off? Would that happen suddenly or extremely slowly, as in millions or billions of years? Of course, when you consider something that happens slowly, you're considering the weathering and erosion of the mountain down to literally nothing. Question number seven, what is this thing and what does it represent? Of course we know this as a geologic time scale and the beginning of Earth is thought to be around 4.6 billion years ago and of course today is today. So when we look at the geologic time scale a little bit more closely we see that this section that's highlighted in the Dosiri um, program is known as Precambrian. Precambrian is, uh, represents the oldest rocks. We know the least about Precambrian age rocks. And it also encompasses 87% of the entire geologic time scale. This section of the geologic time scale is known as the Paleozoic Era. Next we have Mesozoic Era, and finally we have Cenozoic Era. So of the three eras listed, which era is known as the Age of Invertebrates? Which era is known as the Age of Dinosaurs or the Age of Reptiles? And which era is known as the Age of Mammals or the Age of Man? <coughs> Question number nine. Let's say that a, a aspiring geologist or even a... Um, Common Joe, perhaps, would happen upon this fellow. So how do scientists collect information about this animal that's pictured here? And of course this animal that's pictured is a, a dinosaur, it's a fossil, but uh, this little discussion can apply to e uh, even living animals. So of course you begin with an idea, this is supposed to represent a light bulb, I'm not the best artist in the world. An idea quickly becomes a hypothesis if it sounds reasonable. Of course, through extensive testing and experimentation, you develop or you may develop a theory behind your uh, identity of an animal. And of course, we want to know what that is called, that whole process. So what I'm drawing here is a picture of a magic box that a Hershey's bar was placed into, but of course it didn't look like our modern uh, microwaves uh, do today. And so this really uh, kind of goes to show that through um, accidents, a lot of discoveries in science are made. And of course, the, Hershey's, the famous Hershey bar story 
goes that uh, Hershey's bar was placed in a magic box emitting microwave radiation and the Hershey's bar melted. So question number 11, we want to examine the four spheres of the Earth. So here you are. So can you name the four spheres? Of course, you belong to the biosphere as well as all living things. And you're breathing air. It may not be the best clean air. It probably is polluted. So this is the second sphere called the atmosphere, of course. All this rock that you're standing on is part of the geosphere. And, of course, what's missing is all the water of the planet, which is called the hydrosphere. Question number 12. We take a look at a picture of this Earth, and we want to determine where does the Earth get its uh, forms of energy. So, of, co of course, one form of energy comes from the sun, which is an external uh, energy source. We also have internal energy, which comes from the Earth's uh, core and mantle, which is molten hot liquid rock. So the question that I'm posing here in Dosiri is which can we not live without? Can we go without the sun or can we go without the internal? And of course the answer to the question is we cannot live without the sun. So this is a rock cycle and uh, the things that you want to know about the rock cycle of course are the three types of rocks that are pictured here and they are <coughs> igneous, sedimentary rock, and metamorphic rock. So when you look at the three layers of the earth when they're divided up in this way of course the three layers are the crust, the mantle, and the core. The crust consists of light colored elements and minerals and rocks and of course the elements are silicon and oxygen which combine to form silicon dioxide or SiO2 which is quartz. When you look at the uh, core of the earth it's comprised of very heavy elements, such as nickel and iron. So dissecting the earth in this way is dissecting the earth in terms of its chemical composition. You have light stuff at the top and the very heavy or dark stuff down below. Another way to look at the uh, layers of the earth is to divide them up by uh, other properties. So when we examine the crust and the upper part of the mantle, this all behaves as one way and this uh, layer is called the lithosphere and how it behaves is very rigidly and of course if we look at this next chunk of mantle which is uh, lying below the lithosphere this is behaving um, well first of all it's actually named the asthenosphere which is below the lithosphere and it's behaving very much like a plastic so when you divide the earth up in this way you're dividing it in terms of its physical properties you have rigid stuff on the top and you have more plastic gooey stuff down below. <clears throat> so again we show the layers of the earth but this time we're concentrating on the surface of the earth. So when you look at the left part of this earth this is what you're viewing uh, from space if you were out there looking at the earth and of course you're looking uh, and finding continents all over the earth and of course you also see oceans and that's really the only two things you see negating clouds, of course, that you see from space. Now, if we look at the U.S., for example, all continental land masses uh, typically have a very uh, wide range, uh, broad area of, of earth, of rock, which are known as shields. Shields are very, very old. They're usually Precambrian rocks. And there's a shield in pretty much every continent. Now, the shield actually goes below this red layer, but what's covering the shield in, in this red layer is sedimentary rocks. So this is what's now called the stable platform. So shield and stable platforms uh, form the uh, stable interior of continents. And of course as far as North America is concerned, on the margins uh, of North America we have mountain belts. And pretty much every continental landmass in the world has mountain belts, shields, and stable platforms. So when we try to find the major shields of the world, of course, we have here in Canada, we have the Canadian Shield, which is what I was showing you in the previous um, picture. South America has its own shield. There's African Shield, Australian Shield, and uh, Eurasian Shields. And it should be noted that in the uh, um, Australian Shield, this is where some of the oldest um, fragments of rocks have uh, recently been discovered. 
are dating around 4.3 billion, and of course the Earth is thought to be about 4.6 billion. So again, uh, these are all Precambrian age rocks, and they're typically metamorphic because they have at least come to that part of the rock cycle, maybe going through igneous and sedimentary phases. So now we're going to turn our attention to the oceans, looking underneath the oceans. And of course I note in the Doceri uh, a, a program that this is not to scale. So this part of the ocean, which you can um, basically scuba dive on, is known as the continental shelf. Way out here deep is uh, the, the wall, as scuba divers would call it, or also known as the continental slope. And then where it starts to even out when you're in the very deep water, this is called the continental rise. And even though I didn't draw it in this picture, to the right of the continental rise, before you get to that uh, kind of other area, that's the deep ocean basins. So right here in the middle of these oceans, we have mid-ocean ridges. And this is where hot magma is coming up and basically tearing the world apart and the two plates are pulling apart from one another, which I'm going to show in this picture here. So this really leads to the theory of plate tectonics. And I basically answer the own question, is plate tectonics a hypothesis or a theory? Of course, plate tectonics began its life as continental drift from a fellow by the name of Alfred Wegener. And Alfred Wegener had no awareness of what was underneath the oceans. But of course, through plate tectonics, we know, for example, that this part of this region of the Earth is where two plates are pulling apart, and this caused the continents to actually move, which is basically what Alfred Wegener knew about. So that will conclude the end of our Chapter 1 uh, study guide questions and, of course, our Chapter 1 review.